Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another episode of BTOP Live. I have a really special guest today and a really important topic to talk about. We're going to talk about building or facilitating a thriving baseball program, a, a thriving amateur baseball program, uh, which is done very well, from what I can tell, in uh, uh, Mid Iowa and the Mid Iowa Baseball League. So. And I'm going to uh, bring my guest on in just a minute to talk to you uh, to talk to you about that. My guest today, in, in talking about growing a healthy baseball program and facilitating and managing it and everything like that, is uh, my teammate from the Des Moines Grays, the uh, one of the team, one of the longtime members that was. Uh, generous enough, I guess, is, is the way I should say it, to allow me to be a part of that team. I'm very appreciative of the Grays for allowing me to join them in um, the uh, going to the or participating in the uh, the Negro League Baseball Museum Summer Classic Series that was held in Kansas City, and uh, we brought home the championship. So there's my plaque there. So I'm very uh, very pleased with that and happy to. I uh, felt very appreciative to be able to participate as part of the Grays. So he's part of that team, but he's also, uh, on, I believe, on the board of the uh, Mid-Iowa Baseball League that's ran there. So I want to let him tell you about that. I'm not going to prolong this intro any further. So he is standing by. Let me bring him on right now. Hey, Brian. How's it going, man? Hi, Josh. How are you? Good. You hear me I okay? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're just fine, man. Good, it's good to see you again. Yeah, man. good seeing you. Um, how are, how's everything going in Iowa right now? Uh, pretty good. Uh, we wound down. Um, I wound down both my baseball teams last week and won championship and <clears throat> won uh, that wasn't. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Uh, we the thirty and over Bulldogs. We managed to win that uh, division and the tournament. So. Wrap that up Tuesday night, Whoa. and then our 40 and over team uh, among the Saints, and we had a little struggle this year. I uh, didn't have a real good record, but um, we had a interesting game. We scored eight runs in the fourth inning um, to go up eight nothing, and then promptly gave up nine in the fifth, <laughs> and we ended up losing ten to oh, nine. Geez. So uh, <laughs> it was something else. It was two crazy innings that you wouldn't believe, and. Um, yeah, so the season came to an end for me. I know some of the guys are playing this week, wrapping up our 40 and over championship and then our 48 and over championship. So uh, hopefully we get that in. Be yeah. It's supposed to have a little rain, but uh, hopefully they get the games in this week and wrap those up. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the championship, the one, the one team. Yeah, in. thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, that's something we're, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Um, about the league there in Iowa, because as people are hearing you talk about, uh, you know, the the different age divisions and playing playing on multiple teams, that's a that's a kind of a foreign concept here in Oklahoma City because we just have the one league, one age division, and that's kind of what I wanted to dive into here in just a sure. little bit and talk about how that works yep. uh, with you with you guys. Just tell everybody just uh, kind of the cliff notes of your, your journey in baseball and how you ended up where you are today. Well, on a personal standpoint, um, I started playing, you know, as a youngster, Little League and so forth. I lived outside of Dubuque, Iowa. Um, both parents worked. So I, um, at 15 years of age, um, so all the towns around Dubuque, Iowa, Dubuque County have, each town has its own baseball field. And it's got its own semi-pro team. So when you're looking at, um, when you're growing up, you're idolizing these guys that are, you know, in their 20s playing baseball. And and it was always a, a goal to play on the big team. That's kind of how we looked at it. And at 15 years of age, I had to get a ride to my first game. I, I had to be a, the ninth guy um, for a team just outside my hometown of Sherrill, Iowa. And so the coach who was kind of taking over, his dad was a Hall of Fame coach in the area. Um, he came and got me and drove me to the game. And, and I, I played my first game at 15 
um, in that league. So then once high school came around, I, you know, I never played any organized, say, you know, AAU, USSSA, all that stuff, never was involved with that. I uh, just played, you know, in my, with a small town team. And I ended up getting, um, so I played tennis my junior year. And then told myself, if I don't try out, and by this time, you know, I could drive and I could get to practice. Um, where in the past, that was a, that was kind of part of the issue was not being able to get there with mom and dad working and so forth. So once that all came about, um, senior year, I told myself, I got to do this or I'm going to hate myself for it. So I went out for baseball. That's my senior year. And they had 22 guys out, could keep 20. I was one of the two cuts. And at the time, they had a rule where you couldn't play semi-pro baseball and high school baseball at the same time. You had to basically, you know, pick or choose. Well, the coach at the time, who was also a Hall of Fame coach in the state of Iowa, he pulled me aside and he said the only reason he was letting me go was um, he was afraid I was going to lose my love of the game if I sat on the bench because I hadn't earned my way through the system like all the other players had. Um, so if I had made the team, I would have sat on the bench, you know, being one or two guys behind, um, say the starting third baseman is kind of the, the position I had tried out for. And if that happened, he didn't want me to, to lose my love for the game. So cut me loose. Um, it was a difficult decision. I made it hard for him. I hit a home run that day in our scrimmage. First time I ever put one over the fence in my life. Um, so that, that same night I had a semi-pro baseball game and I went to that and hit another home run. So two in one day, um, only time I've ever done that. And, um, so that's kind of how, how things, how, kind of how the path started going for me. Um, by the end of the summer, half the team had quit the high school team. So, um, I probably could have helped, but and that was it. Um, went on to college, went to Iowa State, of course, did not play baseball there. Um, came home every summer, played with my semi-pro team, uh, met a lot of great guys along the way. And then in 96, I stayed at Iowa State in Ames for summer school. And that was the first summer I didn't play baseball in my life. And it was difficult. Um, our team that I had played for for years and in, in the semi-pro league folded that summer um, and basically I had nowhere to nowhere to play and ended up mm -hmm. uh, going to a small town south of Ames um, girlfriend at the time we went to a swimming pool and there was a baseball field next to it there's a baseball game going on and <clears throat> I just went in and asked you know what the heck is this all about and couple of guys had ISU rugby shirts on and, and I knew some of the rugby guys through a friend. So I uh, just kind of connected and told me, you know, they told me it was a league in central Iowa. And I said, Hey, I'm totally interested. I want to play. What can I do to get on a team next year? And, and I got in touch with somebody and stayed connected over the winter. And I joined the mid Iowa baseball league in 1997. <clears throat> so, huh. Mid-Iowa Baseball started in 1994. Um, they became affiliated with the Men's Senior Baseball League, so MSBL, MABL out of New York. Um, so that started in 94. I joined in 97. And so this would be my 25th year I just completed. Dang. Yeah. Dude, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of it. You had one summer you didn't play in your whole life, basically. One, and from... it was miserable. <laughs> I, I can't yeah. tell you the amount of baseballs I threw against a brick wall, just trying to stay, stay sharp. And, right. and, uh, um, so that's what I did. I just, you know, I yeah. found a brick wall to throw against literally. Yeah. Do you mind me asking how old you are? I just turned 48 two weeks ago. Yeah. Wow. Cool. So you're one of the youngins on the team. <laughs> on the team that we play Yes. On. I, uh, yeah, for the most part, um, most guys on that team, what was our average? I think it was 49.5 is what somebody, John said. Yeah. Oh, really? So, yeah, just a little under the average. Yeah, I think I was the yeah, baby. Yeah, you were. <laughs> yeah, 41, 41. Um, but uh, to, to maybe make some people feel better, I came home with some knee problems, so. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> no, that, but they're feeling good today. Good. I mean, uh, th this whole journey with I've never had knee I've never had knee problems in my life. And, well, I take that back. I had growing pain knee problems when I was like in ninth grade. But other than that, you know, my knees have always held up pretty good. And so to man, it sucks, man, because um, when I got home, I played on it for our uh, playoffs, and then the other knee. Uh, because I'm putting all the weight on that one, the other knee ended up worse than the one I actually injured. Sure. So, so, but um, I'm I've been resting it quite a bit. It's been, it's 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 turning out okay. I think it's gonna be all right. But um, yeah, so I mean, you know, as I've told a lot of people, and and I don't know if I, you and I talked about this or not uh, in Kansas City, but. Um, <clears throat> This is just a whole new world for me, and of course I'm eating it up, and I'm I'm I get really jealous sometimes, like all the coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Like I hear your stories, like yours, where you never stopped playing uh, because something like this existed. Um, and but you know, it seems like uh, you know, in talking to you, you know, it's it's a whole how it's done in Iowa and or the Mid Iowa Baseball League is really different than what it is here in Oklahoma city. And I'm starting to see that, that it's, uh, there are other places that it's done really well like that too. And so, uh, that's what I really wanted to talk to you about was what, what you guys are doing to make it so successful. So let me just tell you what I know about your league and you can fill in, uh, fill in the gaps here. And we'll talk about how you, uh, what, how, cause you're on the board, right? Yes. I'm the vice president and yep. Okay. All right, and so, uh, so how um, uh, those of you guys in those leadership positions, what you're doing to keep it healthy and keep it, uh, uh, you know, ahead of the curve or whatever it, it takes to make it work well. Um, but uh, so, you know, what I gather is that, you know, you guys, uh, you got, in a nutshell, you run, it's a big league, but you run, um, you know, about four different age, four different age groups, yep. basically. Um, or uh, age divisions, um, and you know it's and from what I could tell, just based upon some of the things I was reading, you got to have at least like a hundred players, I would think. <laughs> um, is that is that about right? Um, like, two hundred and ninety this year. Oh my god! Yeah. Okay, all right, <laughs> yeah. So I way undershot yeah. it there. Um, I was just trying to base. I was based upon just some of the things I was reading um, from how you guys were talking, but. But on top of that, you you guys do all these like uh, ceremonial things, like uh, the Hall of Fame inductions, and look like you had a big dinner or a banquet or something like that to do that. So, um, you know, in in, comp in comparison to a league like Oklahoma City, that's got eighteen and over. That's it. Seven teams. Um, I couldn't even tell you how many players. Uh, you know, uh, not many. I would say uh, it seemed like this year, particularly um, all, most of the teams had trouble getting players to show. I know there was a lot of last minute scrambling people sharing players, you know, from different teams just to fill spots, you know? And so, so anyways, uh, kind of, so that's very minimal information about what I know about the mid Iowa league. So kind of fill us in with the rest of the numbers there. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, started in 94. Uh, Tim Kurgan right. was our league president back then. Um, Tim still plays. Uh, he's in his upper 50s now, close to 60. And um, he's now, uh, yeah, he's playing in that 48 and over division. Um, Tim was president from 94 to 2003. And when I joined in 97, first thing I did was um, raise my hand and said, what can I do to help? Um, not knowing if they needed help or not. I, that's just kind of, once I got to college and, and um, kind of came out of my shell, I decided, you know, being part of a group or an organization that's, that, that was kind of, you know, motivating to me. Um, having that year off from baseball really taught me a lesson that I carry with me today. And that is if somebody wants to play baseball, I'm going to find a way for that person to do so. 
Um, and that's mm-hmm. kind of how I lived my life since joining and basically just helping out where I could. Um, I was, Tim selected me personally to take over the league in 2004 when he wanted to step down. He said, will you take this over for me and run the show? And um, I said, you know, absolutely. And, and was voted in. So I was commissioner, I was league president. And we kind of changed the structure during my time. Um, you know, I, we just kind of, I looked at, you know, the structure of major league baseball and the head guy was, you know, not a president, he was a commissioner. And then you had presidents of the national and American league. And I thought, okay, we've got two divisions here. We've got an 18 and a 30 and over at the time. Um, how do we, you know, we can, how can we structure our league? So I'm not doing all the work. <clears throat> so I made uh, selected division presidents for those. And then we selected okay. vice presidents to help them out. And I said, okay, you guys deal with your issues. If you're 18 and over 30 and over deal with your issues. And if you have to bring something to me, go ahead and do that. So, you know, we're structured. We've got a board of directors, um, treasurer, a secretary, um, age directors, uh, marketing website. Um, We've got player relations. So free agents coming in, we've got somebody to kind of handle that. So, Divide and conquer um, is the big thing. And we split that out. We've got a 15 person board. And in 2000, so I took over in 2004, we had just added our third division. And at the time it was a 38 and over. Um, So we had a 18, 28, 38. That was 2002 when we split off into three divisions and we kind of let that 38 and over division kind of run itself as well. So that division had a board or a president and a vice president, and they were in charge of scheduling and finding fields and, and the rest of us would help out where we needed to. And that we just let that division run it show, run it show it on its own. So um, eventually 2007 came along and I had my first child, Addison. Um, after she was born, um, things got busy, busier. Um, my wife didn't like the headaches that came along with the baseball league and all the time away from, um, you know, playing and running the organization and all that. So I decided at the time to, um, step down from the commissioner role and, um, just kind of into a, maybe the vice president role or, or you know, any other role that was going to be needed. So we uh, selected John Linden to take over. And John has been in the commissioner role now since 2008. Um, <clears throat> we added the fourth division. So now we are um, currently 18 and over, 30 and over, 40 and over, and 48 and over. So four divisions, we've got 20 total teams, um, six teams in 18, six teams in 30, four in 40, and four in 48. Um, Looking at history here, I've got my computer up. John kind of maxed things out in 2009. We had 37 teams and over probably over 500 unique players. Um, Jeez, if you, if you wow. think about what was going on in 2009, that's right after the market crashed. Um, right. so it's pretty impressive that we were able to keep growing during that time. And the thing that led us to do that was the availability of fields, um, guys looking for things to do and, you know, just word of mouth. Um, you think about how the league started and it was just you know basically a bunch of guys that had been away from the game for so long and wanted to play baseball again guys you know playing slow pitch softball and and oh my gosh there's a baseball league what are we you know let's try that out so you had you know some softball guys just come over and and start playing baseball and i used to play slow pitch softball for many years on the side um I don't think it affected my swing negatively, but I sure did get better defensively um, playing slow pitch. And um, <clears throat> so until I turned, once I turned 35, I was able to qualify for that division. Then I shut down slow pitch softball for good and was able to play in two different divisions um, of baseball. And, and that's what I've done ever since. So 
Um, but just thinking about how, like I said, how the league, you know, grew exponentially through the mid 2000s. Um, you know, each of our age groups, we might have had, I think our, you know, our 30 and over, what was our 28 and over division? We split that, there were 12 teams, we split it into three different divisions within the age group itself. Mm-hmm. So you'd have, um, uh, we kind of split it by, I'd say talent level. So we had our top teams in the top division, middle teams based on past records in the middle. And then you would play those teams more often. And that way it gave, you know, those lesser teams a chance to win a championship, you know, win their division. And then we went on and played some playoffs and involved everybody. And um, that was pretty unique in, in how we did that. So, but, you know, now that, you know, times are changing again. Uh, we see the evolution of it and, and we're losing guys. Mm-hmm. Um, kids are burnt out, I think, is one of the big things. Um, kids play so much, you know, U triple SA and, and leading up to mm-hmm. high school, they're playing 50 to 60 games a summer. Um, then they get into high school and they're, you know, practicing and you play 30 to 40 games of high school ball. And, mm-hmm. and then after that, if you don't go into college, you know, you pretty well have been, you're, you're tired of it, um, is what we're seeing. And getting those younger mm-hmm. guys to recommit, it takes a couple of years. Um, they might be out of the game three, four years, and all of a sudden they get that itch again, and they come back when they're in their mid-20s. Um, right. So we're seeing that a little bit. But overall, um, you know, the other thing we're seeing is, is how our league is aging. All the guys that started the league in 1994, if you think about that, that's 28 years ago. If they were starting when they were 30, that puts them around 60 years of age. So um, many of them are still playing. Many of them are still in great shape. Um, Baseball keeps you young, but there are guys that, you know, have, you know, maybe due to injuries, um, other health issues have had been forced to stop playing and it's just, you know, the, the nature of things. So that's, right. you know, the evolution of our, our league is, is, you know, quite a, quite a change. Um, but John, you know, continues to, to uh, push forward and we've had another successful mm-hmm. year. In fact, we've had just one game this summer get rained out. We're still hoping to make that up. If we do, we'd play every single game that was scheduled um, this year. So pretty successful season Mm -hmm. overall and you know looking forward to year 29 and in mid-iowa baseball next year Uh, i'm all about this (laughs) amateur ball right now i'm like um you know this this could be a cash crop and uh dan zahn's mentioning what's going on in rippy right now and uh and and bruce tomey has mentioned that too like they have a lot of turnout come watch those guys play in that town. Uh, so what do you think about that? Like, as you're built, watching this league build, it's like having trouble with the younger guys, but what about interest from the older guys? Uh, do you think there's something there with that? Yeah, if if I go back to my semi-pro days in Dubuque, um, like I said, every town has a, has a field and a team. Um, <clears throat> one of them being Dyersville, where the Field of Dreams is. Um, they've had you know there's such a history there you know they have a, each town has its own tournament and the tournaments you know 16 team tournaments so it goes on for a week week and a half um most of the players now are you know out of high school just out of high school college kids so dubuque's going to have university of dubuque clark university loris college um there's other schools you know not far away cedar rapids isn't far away so there's all kinds of college kids coming back last summer during COVID when, you know, everything was shut down and they just fired back up. Um, they had a lot of University of Iowa kids come up and play. And when those tournaments are going on, the entire towns come out and watch. So you're going to have, Dyersville, for example, would have thousands in the stands and the smaller communities might have 500 to 600. Um, I, that's when I was growing up, that's what was cool to me was I'm going to get to play in front of all these people 
And once that happened, that, that was cool. It was, it was really neat to come out and, and you were a part of the community. You were the face of the community wearing that Jersey and that town's name across your chest. Um, <clears throat> in Des Moines, that's very, very hard for us to do. Um, and even Oklahoma city, you know, you don't have that connection because, you know, if, if you're playing a game at a local high school, you're renting that facility out and there's no real connection. So that, that was such a change for me coming down to Des Moines. But back when I started in 97, we were playing in smaller communities. We were driving to, um, we were driving maybe, you know, an hour and a half to a, a smaller town because they had a team based out of that town. Um, Knoxville, Iowa, Creston, Iowa, Grinnell, Newton, smaller towns around um, central Iowa that we would drive, you know, an hour, hour and a half to get to, and we'd play ball and, and they would have the field and more people would come out and watch. But if we were to rent uh, the local high school field, you know, in, in, in downtown Des Moines, we wouldn't, you know, other than family and friends, um, that's all you would have mm -hmm. for a, for an audience. And, so it's, it's really different. It, it comes down to community. So in Rippey, um, such a small town, but that field draws that whole town there. And, and <clears throat> mm -hmm. you do worry about it because as people get older, you know, those people remember baseball 20, 30 years ago there when it was hot and it was the thing to do. Um, those people are getting older and might not be able to physically get to the game anymore. Um, mm -hmm. That era is dying off, literally. And that, that's heartbreaking, <laughs> to be honest. Um, the mm -hmm. guys that, you know, I remember playing with, you know, are now in their upper 50s, 60s. Um, right. And, you know, we're losing some here and there. Uh, you know, it's yeah. just, it's, it's life and, and that's how that goes. But um, to be honest. But that's why I think. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just, you know, thinking, looking into the future, there are a couple complexes being built in the Des Moines area. Um, with that happening, if there's more than one field at these complexes that we would have access to play on, um, rumor is some are gonna be turfed, which would be great on us old guys' legs. Um, but again, yeah. no rain outs, so you're able to play. But something like that, you can get sponsorships and you can you know, you can go to a local bar and say, hey, put your name across our chest and, and we'll be, you know, yeah. we'll, you know, almost like a, you know, softball organizations do um, slow pitch, you know, they have, yeah. you know, bars and grills and, you know, whatever construction company and, and they sponsor them and mm -hmm. they get some bucks to do that. That's something we could do if we could hang a banner on, on the field, but without having those fields, that's our biggest challenge, always been our biggest challenge. Um, with mid Iowa baseball is is field availability. We're driving to for our eighteen and over guys. We're driving to Ames. Um, we're playing on the old, you know, Cyclones Iowa State Cyclones field um, because Iowa State doesn't have a baseball team. Um, that field is still there. It's still taken care of, and we use that field. Um, and then we're using Rippy. We're using you know in the past oh. years we've used Newton. So we're driving quite a ways away from central Des Moines. And it's just because our high schools don't want anybody using their fields yeah. more than what their existing teams do. So they don't want to burn them up. And I saw that with my you know, own community I live in. We used their field for years and years. Um, they didn't care about the money. Um, the money went to the baseball program that we you know, paid for run, running the field. Um, and then things kind of changed where most high schools use like a community education program. So if you want to rent the football stadium, you want to rent the track, you want to rent the soccer field, you pay that, you pay that rental fee. And if you're a nonprofit versus a for-profit organization, those fees are different. Well, we're a nonprofit organization, but we're not connected to the school. So we would pay a higher fee and we've just been priced out. Uh, we can't, we'd have to raise our dues for our players, um, you right. know, almost twice as much as we're paying to get on local fields just because of what they're charging. And, and that's been our biggest challenge. So we're still fine on fields. All our older guys are playing on, you know, almost 
you know, the larger little league fields in the areas. So that's what we use. And being a wood bat organization, um, that works for us. So especially as we're getting older. Maybe maybe you guys will, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe there will there'll come a situation where you'll be able to get your own field someday. If we hit the lottery, if somebody hits a lottery in our organization, that's <laughs> – <laughs> that's kind of been the talk is like, yeah. if I ever hit the lottery, I'm building a fourplex and, and we're going to play baseball yeah. all through the night. And yeah, it's, it, we're still dreams. waiting. <laughs> yeah. So in a league like ours, it's really small where we're wanting to grow it. What, what would you, in, in for other leagues like that out there, like what would you say would be like next steps? Because we've got definitely, we're not going to be able to, we're talking mid Iowa has been growing for 20, almost 30 years. Right. So, um, you know, so we're not going to go from what we are now to that. So what would be the next steps for us, you think? Yeah, this is where it'd be nice to have John on, um, John Linden being our current commissioner. He does so much, uh, for the league and, yeah. and, um, and he had planned to join us too, for people watching. He just, uh, had, he had something come up. He had to be at, so yeah, he's in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you outed he, him there. He went, he went to a football game last <laughs> Yeah. Nice. So basically, you know, what looking back on how our league started, it was it was having that core group of guys that were willing to stick their necks out um, and even financially stick their wallets out and get it going. Um, I, I can't imagine what those guys put into the league. I know once they took it over. So there was kind of a uh, some sort of league that was going on the previous year and rumor was or if, if I remember correctly you know some umpires were still owed money some fields were still owed money so you know these guys that had got together to play they're oh we'll get you some cash you know and we'll pay in and it never happened well of course Tim took things over and I think they had to kind of really smooth a lot of the relationships over with umpires and field owners um, mm -hmm. to keep the things going and God knows how much, you know, of their own cash they, they put into that. Um, but as things grew, just having that board structure. So like I mentioned, we're a nonprofit. So we are registered with the state of Iowa um, as a nonprofit organization. We had, you know, a guy who that's a lawyer um, that was playing back then kind of wrote up our bylaws and got us all the you know the requirements with the state of Iowa that you you know you file all the paperwork there mm -hmm. so we had all that so it, you know we're becoming a a structured league and by doing so we're going to be successful so as things keep growing you just keep adding layers and you know we've got a treasurer now watching the books and you got a secretary taking notes at meetings and recording history and and as the league keeps growing, like I said, I, when I took over, I said, let's split off these divisions and make sure everybody is, you know, taken care of. So let's put a president in place for each division. Let's put a vice president in place. Let's get somebody to take over this. You know, we had a free agent list on our website. That was tough to manage. Let's put somebody in charge of player relations so they can, you know, take those players and find a good fit for them. And things just kind of evolved. Um, John's got things running now where, you know, we have a board meeting every January, um, maybe one at the end in November of the season, just to kind of recap. But the league really runs itself. Um, there's a lot that goes on, you know, scheduling. Um, each division president takes care of that with uh, scheduling their own games for the division. So it's, it, like I said, a divide and conquer. Make sure you're, you're, doing everything to uh um you know keep things running smoothly and and it's not all the burden doesn't fall on one person because when i took over i kind of i sense that's how things were were in the past tim was taking a lot of the burden right. and eventually he got burned out and i didn't want that to happen and and so things have been kind of successful since um the other thing we've changed recently is how we collect payments. Um, in the past, we, we would basically have a manager's meeting, bring a check, and that was before the season would start. Um, and you can imagine how difficult it was for 
managers to know who was going to play for them. And, you know, maybe we're having a manager meeting in say March or April, who's going to be playing for them in May and June. And maybe they don't have their team form, but we're looking for say a $2,000, $3,000 check or whatever it was that year. <clears throat> a lot of times a manager would front that. I ran a team for a few years. Um, I'd write the check. I just knew what was, you know, what that was going to be. So I set that money aside. I wrote the check and then collected from my, my guys after the fact. And, and sometimes I broke even, sometimes I, you know, paid a little bit too much out of my own pocket, but you know, that was the cost of having your own team. Eventually we heard enough complaints about that system that, you know, guys getting burned, managers getting burned. Um, that we decided to put it into the league's hands. So now we're um, doing that through our website where we're collecting funds. <clears throat> Recently, mm -hmm. I think I think the last two or three years, we've put it as a player fee. So now we're collecting on a player basis. So you're not eligible to play until you pay to play. Um, if you're gonna be a full-time player, there's it's one fee. If you're a part-time mm -hmm. player, it's another. If you're a guy that's going to play two or three games on an emergency basis, we only charge you, you know, maybe 50 bucks for that. Um, but if you're playing for two or more teams, you kind of get a discount. You, you, you don't pay a full team fee for each. You kind of, we, you know, we might cut that and you might pay a, you know, one and a half times of the two times rate, you know, two player rate. So right. we've, we've done that. It's, it's taken care of through our website. Um, we've got league lineup as our kind of our site host and um but going so do you have uh do you have rules for like a part-time player can only play a certain amount of games yeah Is that how it works yeah or? we kind of target you know if it typically our season's around 15 or 16 league games and then tournament so if you're a part-time player we you know if you go over eight games then you're pretty well considered full-time and and we will look at that to see if anyone's abusing it. Um, if it's mm -hmm. abused, then we're going to reach out and say, hey, you, you played, you know, 15 games and paid for a part-time rate. You're, make up the difference. Right. And people do. Um, it, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Have guys that get hurt. You know, they play one game, they get hurt, and then they want a refund. Well, that's kind of a sticky area where, you know, if, if you open up that can of worms, a guy just walks off and quits and wants his money back that's different than a guy, you know, blowing out his, you know, ACL or something and, or his elbow and, right. and can't. So case by case basis in that situation, but typically, you know, we're not going to refund a guy if, if he's committed to play because he's leaving his manager hanging. And then if it's an injury, of course, right. that's completely different, but the money thing's big. Sure. Um, but just doing that up front and getting that taken care of ahead of things. So you've got to pay, mm -hmm. you've got to sign your waiver then you're eligible. Um, if you don't, you're not. And yeah. get that done. And it's kind of put right. taking that away from the manager's responsibility and put it in the player. Um, we keep a running list so guys know, you know, who signed up, who's taking care of it, and and then uh, you can move right. forward. So, you right. know. Is it, do you think it's important to be a part of an organization like MSBL or NABA or? That's a really good question. Um, we do it just because we've had that relationship forever and we've typically sent a team to one of the national tournaments every year if not two th two or three teams um and by doing so we're covered for a player fee in that case so they're not nationals isn't going to charge you for um, going to a tournament because right. you're part of that organization you play in that you pay a national fee as part of your dues um, you know, it's $26 a guy. What's that money being used for? We get that question a lot and it's really used for protection in case we can't get insurance. Um, we have to be, you have to be insured. You have to have insurance to mm -hmm. cover the fields you play on. Um, they've got to be protected. We've got to be protected as a board. Um, you know, boards could get sued for, you know, not being fair to somebody or whatever. But um, so we've got that all insurance built in. So insurance is a big thing and we've got to find those carriers. And if that cost would get out of control, the national organization does have um, 
access to insurance carriers that would cover us. So that protection is there. Um, but just being part of the organization, being able to attend the tournaments, um, that's that's kind of the, the main yeah. thing. Does it help giving you clout and like securing fields and stuff? Like you're like telling someone, hey, we're part of the MSBL. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, you're not just some Sandlot team, you know, wanting to just use our field. That's big. Um, I remember going into athletic director offices when I was commissioner and I would basically put a presentation together for them, you know, a PowerPoint or a, a pamphlet mm -hmm. and, and take a, you know, I know in the past they, you know, the orga national organization had sent pamphlets to us to, to give out. Um, and that would be big in their eyes. We're part of a national organization based out of New York. It's been going on since 1987 mm -hmm. and, and just give them that spiel and um, you've got a lot more credibility. You're just not out there to play baseball. And then you turn around, you, you try to give back to the community. So we always make it a, um, you know, a point to give back in some way, donate to, mm -hmm. a, you know, we make a donation to different charities every year. Um, we've held different kind of, you know, all-star games, home run derbies, where we've raised money for different causes. Um, <clears throat> the one I'm most proud of back in 2004, right after I took over, um, I had a, t we had a teammate, Dan Zahn and I had a teammate and he was just awesome. He was just a great guy. He was a, so a social worker. So didn't make a ho whole heck of a lot of money, um, but he came out every day and probably had the same shoes on he had back in high school, but he was just a, a crazy good ball player and a great guy. Um, he always came, you know, each year and his wife was pregnant again. I think they had six kids total and it was just kind of a running joke he'd show up and and how many kids you have in this time <laughs> it's just it was right. crazy but um he ended up getting murdered by one of his clients so he was he had a troubled youth and um you know i can't even remember the whole story anymore but um the the kid shot him and somebody else and um he, he passed away wow. so that was, you know, 2003 or so. So in 2004, we held a all-star game um, and held a benefit for him. And, and we raised like 3,300 bucks for the family that night. And uh, awesome. it's just something That's that cool. everybody still remembers to this day. It was kind of one of our first big all-star games that we put together and, and it was just mm -hmm. a huge event. And, and so we've done things like that since um, we've traded all-star games with Omaha Mm -hmm. um, we played at the old Rosenblatt Stadium before that was torn down, where they used to hold, have the College World Series. Mm -hmm. They came over and played at Principal Park with us. So, you know, we've done all kinds of things with different organizations and and uh, just made sure it was more than just showing up at the ball yard and playing baseball. We're, we're part of the community. And, and as I mentioned, we were at uh, Principal yeah. Park um, last, last yeah. Friday for a Hall of Fame event. And and just um got a you know a great reaction great response from from doing that too so yeah so you take care and uh would you i have a favor to ask of you yeah um if you could filter through the comments first of all and just make sure we didn't miss anybody uh, i like to just show appreciation to the people that did participate in discussion and watched um and if there's anything to reply to to do that but also, uh, make sure you put any links that you want to put in the comments so people know how to find the Mid-Iowa Baseball League uh, Facebook page, for example, if there's Instagram or any other links that you think are important to share to help, especially in helping to kind of fit with the topic of helping people develop um, their leagues. And um, additionally, if you are available for consult, you know, that would also be something important to you might mention in there too yeah definitely um, john and i are always willing to help and kind of steer guys in the, the right direction we've we feel we've done a pretty good job you know 28 years of this and and it's been pretty successful so uh, we're doing something right we hope so and uh but yeah our website's got tons of information so i'll definitely put that in the link and and there's all kinds of history out there and and uh mm -hmm. And I keep that up. That's one of my jobs too, is to, to kind of keep our website up. So 
Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely there to to look over. All right, I appreciate it, man. Let's stay in contact. Absolutely. All right, all right Josh. All right. Hopefully, hopefully, I don't know. I gotta hit John up, but hopefully, uh, I might be able to uh, be with you guys and uphold our title and absolutely for the next <laughs> Kansas City tournament. So. Sounds good. All right. All right. Man. Take care. You take care. Get some sleep. Yeah, you too. We'll see Bye. You. All right, there, there you got it, guys. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, that's Brian Schuler, Mid Iowa Baseball League. You guys, please comment what you thought about that interview. Uh, if you, uh, whether you're watching it live or you're watching the rebroadcast of it. So, anyways, I appreciate all of you that watched. Um, Eric Berg, thank you. Uh, Stan Tate. Uh, I saw Eddie Lamar and Dan Zahn were having just quite the conversation uh there so appreciate you guys connecting anybody else uh that 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 chimed in anyways again uh appreciate all of you that watched and uh please tune in next time for the next btop live see you later